Welcome to the Freak Show, fellow freaks. I'm Matthew Brockmeyer. I'm Krista Carmen. And this is... Murder Coaster. The psychopathy and sociopathy inherent in serial killers manifests itself in many criminally devious ways. Many like David Berkowitz, a.k.a. the Son of Sam, are also pyromaniacs and arsonists. Others, like Golden State killer Joseph D'Angelo, are thieves. Ted Bundy was a kleptomaniac, stole compulsively for the sheer thrill of it, while Richard Ramirez, the infamous Night Stalker, robbed houses as a means of survival. Israel Keys was a straight-up bank robber, but very rarely do we see a serial killer who runs their own complex criminal enterprise, like our subject today, who not only conducted sophisticated banking and extortion schemes, but was also an accomplished counterfeiter. He had his own printing press and printed out $20 bills by the thousands in order to finance his sick and devious reign of terror and horror. Ladies and gentlemen, today we bring you the incredibly disturbing and fascinating story of Mike DeBartolevin, the mall passer. Let's begin. The Secret Service is one of the oldest of all U.S. federal law enforcement agencies. Most believe that the Secret Service's sole goal is to protect the president and other political figures, and that the origin of the Secret Service can be traced back to the day Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. But this is just a coincidence, and the Secret Service was not formed as an organization to protect politicians, but to fight money counterfeiting. In 1865, the United States had only recently started printing paper money again in order to fund the Civil War. And already over a third, and by some estimates, even half of all paper money was counterfeit. A staggering amount. So on April 14th, 1865, Treasury Secretary Hugh McCulloch told President Lincoln that rewards for counterfeiters were not working, and that a, quote, continuous organized effort, unquote, should be installed. Lincoln agreed. The Secret Service was established, and Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth only hours later. That is a gnarly timeline. <laughs> On July 5th, 1865, William P. Wood was sworn in as the first chief of the Treasury Department's new Secret Service to investigate forgery, and within a year, 200 counterfeiters had been arrested. It wasn't until two more U.S. presidents were assassinated by gunshot, James A. Garfield in 1881 and William McKinley in 1901, that Congress officially authorized the Treasury's forgery investigators to also protect the commander-in-chief, something they'd already been doing informally. Since then, the list of those protected has grown dramatically to include all members of the first family, as well as the vice president and his or her family, and since Robert Kennedy's murder in 1968, designated presidential candidates, too, as well as foreign heads of state visiting the United States. Today, the Treasury Department employs 2,000 Secret Service agents and also investigates bogus Treasury bills and saving bonds, financial crimes of all sorts, as well as credit card and computer fraud. But the combat of cash counterfeiting is the reason for their existence. There are very few independent counterfeiters. Usually, it's an organized type of crime involving multiple people falling into two camps. They're the printers, the actual creators of the money and their aides, and the passers, various intermediaries and buyers of the fake bills. Counterfeiting operations usually involve those dealing in large cash-only transactions, like high-level drug dealers, the mafia, and various gangs and cartels. They say to be both a printer and a passer is to have an imbecile for a partner. 
That being said, the printer passer is often the most difficult for the Secret Service to apprehend. And there's been notoriously famous printer passers in the past, such as Emanuel Ninger, who was known as Jim the Penman, a German immigrant who was a sign painter and farmer in New Jersey, who meticulously painted each of his fraudulent bills by hand. Machinist Marion Williams began manufacturing fake coins in the 20s and soon moved on to paper currency, continuing for 50 years, only getting caught by chance when he was robbed of unfinished bills. Or elderly junk dealer Americ Jutner, who printed bills for over a decade and wasn't caught until his apartment caught fire. And on Tuesday, July 31st, 1979, it appeared there was a new printer passer at work when bogus $20 bills began to show up in shopping malls. The bills were printed on Crane's Crest White 20-pound paper, widely regarded as the best paper stock available for currency counterfeiting. The bills were done quite professionally and were multi-layered. First, a green ink portrait of the White House as the back plate, then the green treasury seal on the front with serial numbers, then black ink portions, including President Jackson and the tall 20 superimposed over the treasury seal. Further runs added red and blue traces, which mimicked the colored synthetic threads embedded in genuine linen and cotton rag currency stock. The bills had also been sulked or chemically aged in a tea solution and meticulously raggled or hand crumpled. But as complex as the printing process had been, and though they'd easily passed the untrained eye, they were obvious forgeries to an expert, what the Secret Service would label as not a deceptive note. The details weren't crisp, and the bills lacked the raised ink from hand engraved plates. And the counterfeiter hadn't even tried to match the magnetic inks used by the U.S. Bureau of Printing and Engraving. But the treasury seal, which is one of the most difficult aspects of genuine currency to reproduce, was near perfect, with the 13 stars and the exterior circular pattern of tiny points. And the green color was also nearly exact. The characteristics were telex to all 63 Secret Service field offices with its circular number 7215, meaning this new counterfeit was the 7,215th detected by the Secret Service. Luckily, the cashier remembered the man, a white male in his mid-30s, about six feet tall, around 160 pounds, with black hair, wearing wire-rimmed glasses, and with an unusual protrusion on his nose. Floaters, or bills that had been passed off and entered into circulation, began to appear randomly here and there. But by 1980, the counterfeit 20s were appearing in shopping malls across the country. The Valley View Mall in Dallas, Texas, the 12 Oaks Mall in Michigan, the Century Plaza Mall in Birmingham, Alabama, the Cumberland Mall in Virginia, the Blue Hen Mall in Dover, Delaware. The bills were popping up all over in seemingly random places. Durham, North Carolina, Columbus, Ohio, St. Louis, Atlanta, New Orleans, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Tulsa. By the end of 1980, $30,000 of the bills had shown up in 38 states. While the Treasury Department didn't view it as a threat to the integrity of the dollar, Secret Service agents were beginning to stir, the counterfeiter earning himself the moniker, the mall passer as he'd pass off his phony 20s in malls, always near a major interstate where he could quickly disappear into the flow of traffic. In 1982, the mall passer hit shopping malls in 44 states for more than $130,000, always buying small, cheap items like socks, underwear, maps, and books that investigators thought he most likely just threw away, pocketing the change. He was now an embarrassment to the Treasury Department and became a top priority. Special agent in charge of headquarters counterfeit division, Joe E. Coppola, says, quote, deep in my heart, I really wanted to nail this guy. There's nobody that good. 
end quote. What makes a counterfeit investigation so difficult is that often fake bills aren't even noticed until they end up in banks where they go through currency verification and the magnetic toners in the printing ink are tested by scanners. What the Secret Service needed was eyewitnesses, and it took two years before another witness turned up who could recall the suspected mall passer, a cashier in Burnside, Minnesota shopping center. She'd been wary of the bill and called the police, but only after the culprit was long gone. But she gave a good description, 35, six foot, blue eyes, 170 pounds, and wearing wire-rimmed glasses. And just three days later, and a thousand miles away, a clerk in Denver, Colorado, also became suspicious of his new variant on the 7404 edition, giving the same exact description. As more and more clerks recounted their interactions with the mall passer, a portrait began to emerge. The mall passer wore a lot of polyester. Sign of the times there. (laughs) He used disguises, wearing wigs, fake beards, and mustaches. He wore makeup sometimes. He would dye his hair different colors. He avoided male and older females, choosing younger women and girls as cashiers, and distracted them with conversation and questions. But what troubled the Secret Service the most was his ability to move enormous distances extremely quickly almost ghost-like, passing off a fake 20 in a shopping mill in Jacksonville, Florida, and later in the same day, passing bills 425 miles away in Mobile, Alabama. Some agents thought he might be a trucker, while others thought he could be a commercial pilot or businessman and frequent flyer. Other agents worried he might be one of them, a rogue agent. Many people were hired by the Secret Service because of their vast knowledge of counterfeiting and printing, after all. The Secret Service drew a composite and distributed it to malls across the country with a description of the bills. And after years of what appeared random patterns, Treasury agents were beginning to see predictable behavior. There were periodic clusters of passes in Washington, D.C., and not all of them at malls many in food giant grocery stores, making agents suspect the mall passer may either live in D.C. or Northern Virginia, or that the area was a crossroads of sorts. In Charlotte, North Carolina, Agent Frank Hancock had been studying three years of activity in his state and came to the conclusion that it was highly probable the mall passer would return to Charlotte in January and then again in April. He was wrong about January. The mall passer instead went to South Carolina. But he was dead on about April. On Monday, April 25th, 1983, Secret Service agents visited the Eastridge Mall in Gastonia, North Carolina, distributing flyers with the mall passer sketch, alerting personnel and security to be on the lookout. Just three days later, and exactly one year since the last time the mall passer had been in that mall, A manager at B. Dalton Bookseller noticed a man fitting the profile, browsing the shelves, and selecting the paperback Singles by Jacqueline Simenauer. The man strangely asked the cashier to hold the book for him while he went and got some money. Twenty minutes later, he returned. The manager accepted the bill, though he did notice it seemed very faded. After the man left, the suspicious manager phoned a security guard but the pager the security guard was using was broken. So eventually the manager dispatched an employee to find the security guard and a mall-wide security alert relayed a description of the suspect. A security console operator spotted the suspect on one of the 11 black and white security televisions. The mall passer was in Matthews Belk stationery, buying a greeting card. A plainclothes detective was soon shadowing him as he strolled into a toy store. But then, something happened. The suspect, ordinarily very calm and cool, was suddenly jittery, glancing nervously about. He was on to them. Mall security watched the monitors with trepidation as the suspect ducked out a door reading I-85 parking, the detective close behind. 
the suspect bolted through the parking lot to a beat-up, plain-looking two-door car peeling away. But the detective was able to catch the license plate number, RYP87, as the car screeched out the mall exit and all into the eastbound lane of I-85, just as police cruisers were on their way, actually passing him, going in the other direction. No one was surprised when the license plate number came back stolen. His close brush with the law didn't slow the mall passer down, though. Just three days later, he was in Lenox Square Mall in Atlanta, then up to South Carolina and further north to Reading, Pennsylvania, before coming back south to Lynchburg, Virginia. But agents knew an appearance in Lynchburg meant one of two things. The mall passer would either go south on State Route 29 to North Carolina, as he'd done in April, or west onto the I-81, as he'd done in July 1982, heading down through Tennessee and Arkansas toward Dallas and Fort Worth. So a team of agents from Knoxville Field Office went to the eastern Tennessee cities of Bristol, Johnson, and Kingsport, all three of which lay adjacent to I-81 and were past targets. Agents canvassed shopping malls in each of the cities, going store by store, handing out their posters and asking for assistance. The agents' predictions were dead on again because on May 24, 1983, the mall passer got to work in Johnson City, Tennessee. At 7 p.m., he was in the Johnson City Mall, buying a hat for $3.25. Forty minutes later, he was at the Miracle Mall, not far away, passing off 13 more 20s. Forty minutes later, he was at the Fort Henry Mall, where he walked into a B. Dalton's bookstore, buying a Kingsport City map. Then, just as he'd done in Charlotte, he told the cashier to hold the map for him while he went and got some cash from his wife. He returned a few minutes later and attempted to pay with a 20, but the suspicious cashier checked the numbers on the bill and informed the man that the bill was possibly bad, asking if he'd received it for change somewhere. The mall passer looked about nervously and said he'd gotten it from the National Shirt Shop across the mall. When the cashier said she'd call them, he blurted, my wife took it in change and attempted to hand the cashier three single dollars. But the cashier, holding on to the 20, was calling the police. The mall passer stated, let me go get my wife, pointing out into the mall at no one in particular, and hurried out of the store, racing to his car and pulling onto the interstate before police could arrive. The Secret Service thought he was most likely on his way to Knoxville now, and agents were deployed to two shopping malls, the West Town Mall and the New Foothill Mall. Agent Pete Allison went store to store in the Foothills Mall, passing out wanted posters making his final stop at Walden Books, where he showed the flyer to manager Donna Meter. Donna took the flyer with a smile, explaining she'd seen the flyer so often now, she'd recognize him instantly. The agent thanked her and moved on. Just moments later, Donna looked up in amazement to see the mall passer walking into her store. She whispered to her assistant to call the police. The mall passer bought a paperback. She accepted the counterfeit 20, placing it aside, and watched as the mall passer sauntered into KB Toys. Agent Pete Allison was in his car outside the main entrance when the radio call came that the mall passer was in the mall. Pulling his 357 from its holster, the agent leapt from his vehicle and sprinted through the parking lot, bursting through the entrance doors and tearing into the mall at a run. Security ran to inform him the suspect was being trailed and was now at the fountain area. As Agent Allison raced to the fountain, the mall passer realized he'd been made and darted into a section of the mall under construction, breaking into a run. Agent Allison and security guards followed in hot pursuit. The mall passer came bursting out the back exit doors, sprinting across the parking lot, around a corner, and right into two Marysville policemen. He pointed to Agent Allison and the security guard, exclaiming that they'd already cleared him, as Agent Allison screamed into the radio not to let him go. But of course, they weren't going to let him go. Instead, 
They slammed him against the hood of their cruiser and slipped handcuffs over his wrists. They had him. The mall passer was busted. And the story hasn't even begun yet. The mall passer stubbornly refused to speak a word, but they ran his prints and they came up with a hit. He had a record, a long one. He'd first been arrested at 16 for carrying a concealed weapon. Other charges included theft, kidnapping, attempted murder. In fact, he'd even been busted for counterfeiting just six years earlier. His name was Mike DeBartolebin. And when Secret Service agent Mike Steven heard that name, a river of ice ran down his spine. Agent Stephen had led the search of the Bartlebedden's home six years prior. The house had been dark and dirty, full of discarded clothing and cardboard boxes, the kitchen absolutely filthy. Agent Stephen had headed up a thin, shadowy set of stairs, the muffled sound of a radio playing in a bedroom above. He swung the bedroom door open, his service revolver drawn, and peered furtively into the dark room, his hand creeping along the wall in search of a light switch, finally finding one and flicking it on. Suddenly, a movie projector clicked on, breaking the darkness and flooding the wall with graphic pornography, scaring the living shit out of Agent Stephen. He finally managed to find a light and looked about him. Clothes strewn everywhere amongst soda bottles and fast food bags. The walls were all covered in amateur pornography. And dildos, whips, vibrators, handcuffs, and lengths of rope lay strewn about. A reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder sat among bottles of prescription pills. On the filthy bed were several hardcore bondage and porn magazines. And beneath the pillow was a thirty-eight revolver and a 9 millimeter automatic, both loaded. Investigators would also find an astonishing 3,500 rounds of ammunition. Agent Stephen remarked that they had a, quote, very peculiar guy, which, uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Chillingly, there were stacks of index cards, each with a woman's name, address, measurements, and description on them. This is just like some serious silence of the lamb shit going on. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> the other bedroom was padlocked shut. Agents used a sledgehammer to bust in, revealing what they'd been looking for. A multi-lith 1250 printing press with aluminum printing plates and counterfeit money lying around it. Bingo. They had him red-handed, but the house deeply disturbed Agent Stephen, who eventually interviewed DeBartleben's estranged wife, Karen. Karen, who wept and shuddered through the entire interview, especially when the pornography and bondage devices were brought up, explained she was in hiding from her ex-husband and feared for her life. Agent Stephen asked her straight up, are you aware of any other crimes your ex-husband has committed? Specifically, sex crimes, to which she screamed and sobbed. He'll kill me. He'll kill me. He'll kill me. At which point her lawyer interjected and said she wouldn't be answering any more questions. DeBarta Levin was convicted of counterfeiting and served 23 months in the federal penitentiary at Danbury, Connecticut, before he was paroled. And amazingly, and this is insane, a clerk misunderstood the term expired on a parole form to mean deceased. And the National Crime Information Center had listed the Bartleben dead since 1978. So he wasn't even on their radar. As far as the feds and law enforcement had been concerned, he was dead. Convenient cover for your ongoing crimes. Lucky fucker, man. Uh, now in May 1983... Agents are trying to find his printing press. That's their main goal. Seize not only the press, but the aluminum plates that hold the images of the fake 20s. Shutting down the counterfeiting operation is the main objective. They go to an apartment rented in his name, the Oakwood Apartments in Virginia. Agents tear the place apart, looking for any clue that might lead them to the press and the plates. 
but they find nothing except weird porn and more index cards listing the names of women. The place is clean as can be of any actual counterfeiting evidence. They're extremely frustrated. They have to find the printing press and those aluminum plates. Finally, one agent, exasperated, goes through DeBartolebin's yellow pages. Uh, for the youngins, that's a huge book of phone numbers everyone had before the internet. He goes page by page and finally discovers a blank piece of folded paper. The paper has nothing on it, but it is inserted into the storage unit section of the yellow pages. So they call the storage unit and bingo, they got a hit. There's a large unit rented to one of his known aliases. What unfurls next is like something straight out of a horror movie. I'm telling you, it's it's crazy. Here we go. (laughs) Agents swarmed to the storage unit, cracked the padlock, and rolled up the door, immediately discovering the press, a multi-lift 1250, dismantled in the corner under a bunch of chairs, lampshades, and a mattress. Mixed in with the junk was $207,000 in counterfeit 20s, aluminum plates, and ink. Agents also found three 22 Derringers, a 45 Colt Commander semi-automatic, a Smith & Wesson 38 revolver, and a Browning 25 semi-automatic pistol. All kinds of knives, razors, cutting tools, seven stolen license plates, a vast amount of pornography and bondage magazines, as well as police equipment like handcuffs, badges, emergency lights, and a siren. And on a much creepier, darker note, they also discovered a number of women's driver's licenses, as well as 300 pairs of women's underwear, some soiled with blood and semen. There were also wadded up balls of adhesive tape with hair stuck to them. Agents also found audio tapes and hundreds and hundreds of pages of cryptic handwritten notes. Leafing through the handwritten notes was bizarre. There was everything from recipes for methamphetamine, which read in part principal ingredients, ether, and the cotton stuffing from Vicks inhalers. Ah, the good old days when they put speed in asthma inhalers. (laughs) Jesus. To hand-drawn calendars with specific states and shopping malls. There were crude attempts at writing pornography, notes on how to run scams and rob banks, scripts to read over the telephone to fleece the elderly, which we'll get into later, the addresses of hundreds of bank executives, bizarre lists like plenty of nylon rope, belt with O-ring for waist, wraparound shades, rubber bands, trench coat with hood, KY jelly, makeup, eyeshadow, lipstick, enema bag, plenty of speed, downers, and laxatives for her. Oh, God, I have the creeps bad. Another note read. Devices. One, whips, dildos, handcuffs, ceiling harness for upside down in the water. Two, AH harness suspended shoulders. Three, two-handled broom device for dildo. Four, photo and tape equipment. Six, the biggie. Scenario one, tell me about the pain. Describe it. Details. More details. How does it feel? Convince me that you like it. Two, tell me how you feel humiliated, degraded. Three, tell me how you like for me to bite you, slap your face, smack you in the ass. Four, bite or cigar burn or whip at a moment of jack ejaculation. Five, hair. Pull main, say arf, bow wow, nay. Cryptanalysis would uncover transposition ciphers and rudimentary encryptions in which notations were written backwards and abbreviated. For instance, KRF meant Frank. He used C to denote his ex wife, Karen. HCF meant handcuffs. And FAS meant fast or being on speed. Hoofily enough, FM stood for funny money. But most chillingly, investigators would later come to believe KRK meant kidnap, rape, kill. Some of the notes were diary-like rambling thoughts, such as... My beliefs. 
I'm too old, ugly, poor, etc. to attract or fuck young, pretty girls. I need speed to get going and accomplish things. Because Karen rejected me, I'm less of a person. Must get even. All pretty girls will reject me. I hate women. Huh. Tell me how you <laughs> really feel, buddy. <laughs> Chillingly, another red. Just because I'm thinking about murder and want to do it doesn't mean I have to. But I can prepare for it. I can be ready for it. Just in case the opportunity presents itself and everything's perfect. And the tapes were equally as terrifying. Him narrating his goals in a rambling stream of conscious manner. Parts of these tapes were released and can be found and heard. They're chilling in the very mundane and boring way he talks. For instance, in one where he describes his goals in life, he says... I'll try to do this guy's voice. He's got like this really nasally, nerdy voice. Okay. Number one on my list of goals is to establish a new identity, complete with background, school records. I sound like the first George Bush, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> school records, employment records, driver's license, social security, passport. Second on my list of goals is to buy a house with a basement, which is hidden and unable to be detected by ordinary means. Naturally, of course, I would need secret hidden compartments for stash areas for various things, as well as a fun area, secret fun area, which would also include a cage so that I could have a female victim locked up. Also of prime importance, top priority would be an incinerator capable of incinerating at extremely high temperatures, total incineration. Third on my list of goals would be Karen or another female victim first, then Karen. How about eventually both? I'm sorry. I was on mute because I was cracking up. It's not funny. It's horrifying. But like, <laughs> I hate this person so much. He's so sick and awful, but also like such a fucking nerd turd. Totally. Totally. Oh, my God. Well, also, like every once in a while. I can say this at the end too, but like it just occurred like every once in a while I like get freaked the fuck out when I think of how many women are like trapped in some dude's basement right now. Like oh, it man. freaks me the fuck out. <laughs> I I don't even want to think that. I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> awful. Especially like yeah. Especially as a parent and shit. Fuck. Oh my god. Like as soon as second on my list is to buy a house with a basement. Like how many dudes have bought a house specifically with the perfect basement for this fucking purpose. Kills me. Anyway, they also found a cassette tape labeled Karen. After everything had been boxed off and hauled off to where it could be meticulously gone through, an agent took the tape and slipped it into a tape player, hoping for some incriminating counterfeiting evidence, something that could link him to a specific time and place. He pressed play and... Immediately, the jarring sound of a woman screaming burst from the speakers, followed by, What are you going to do to me? Then a male voice asks emotionlessly, Huh? Followed by the woman screaming again. No, no, please, please, what are you doing? Tell me. The man then said, Come on, you gonna be a crybaby? The woman whispering, No, I won't be. The man then giggled as the woman pleaded with him. Untie my hands, Mike. Please, Mike. Don't, don't, don't. Followed by. Let me die. Let me die. Let me die. Why can't I die? Why can't I die? To which DeBartle Eben says, my mother died. And the woman says, I wish I were her. Agent Mertz shut off the machine, stunned and horrified. The Secret Service knew they had someone on their hands whose crimes far surpassed that of counterfeiting. So they contacted the FBI. But the FBI wasn't interested in the case and told them to investigate on their own and let them know what they find. So the Secret Service started a DeBartolebin task force aimed at sifting through the mountains of strange evidence, trying to discover just who Mike DeBartolebin was. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where our story begins. Now, let's really begin. 
James Mitchell DeBartolebin Jr. was born on March 20th, 1940 in Little Rock, Arkansas, to parents Mary Lou and his namesake father, Mike Sr., He had an older sister named Michael Linda, whom everyone just called Linda. It really says something that the father names his first two kids after himself, (laughs) even the girl. About a narcissistic father. Yeah, totally. And he had a younger brother named Ralph, which is sad. Not only did he not get named after his father, like his older brother and sister, his name is synonymous with puke. (laughs) And little Ralph actually spends his life trying to impress, which we'll get to, a sad and tragic story. The Bartolebin's mother, Mary Lou, had lost her mother and father at just 10 years old and grew up being shuffled around relatives, saying she'd never felt love. She was a bit of a wild child, drinking to self-medicate, always looking for a good time. She could play piano by ear and was a great painter, but hated housework, and cooking. Mike's father, on the other hand, grew up during the Depression and was a strict disciplinarian and no-nonsense man. Hmm, Where have we heard that before? He was a lieutenant in the United States Army, and the family moved often, being stationed to Washington, D.C. during World War II, when Mike was just a child. Mike was a stubborn child, often disobedient, and had a temper. Traits that got him into trouble often and labeled a bad boy. His strict disciplinarian father would make him sit in the corner for hours or hold his head under ice water to, quote, cool him off. He was spanked with switches and sticks, and this is before he was even old enough to go to school. Meanwhile, Mary Lou is finding solace in the bottom of a bottle, drinking heavily with neighbor women, sometimes showing up at taverns, dragging the children along. The family are moved to a base in Austin, Texas, in 1945, and DeBartolabin's father is shipped to the South Pacific for a post-World War II atomic testing program. With her husband overseas, Mary Lou falls into utter alcoholism, completely neglecting the children. Linda, his older sister, did her best to take care of her younger brothers, cooking for them, making sure they made it to school while Mary Lou drunkenly trolled the bars, often bringing home strange men. When Mike's father returned, now a major and a battalion commander, he was so embarrassed he requested a transfer, and the family moved to Camp Campbell, Kentucky. He was then promoted to lieutenant colonel, and the family moved to Europe, first West Germany, then The Hague in the Netherlands, where Mike Sr. served as military advisor to the U.S. Embassy. In 1953, Lieutenant Colonel DeBartolebin retired from the Army and accepted a position with the Commerce Department's Federal Bureau of Public Roads in Albany, New York. Young Mike Jr. attended Philip Livingston's Junior High, where he achieved superior academic marks, nearly all in the 90s. But three years later, when he transferred to high school, everything changed. His grades plummeted, and he began to assault his mother so much so that the family became afraid he was capable of killing her. In 1956, Mike is arrested for having a concealed handgun. In 1957, for reckless driving. In his mugshot, he is the epitome of the 1950s juvenile delinquent, wearing a leather jacket, sunglasses, and a bored sneer. Basically, he's like the Fonz. (laughs) A Fonzie that carries a concealed pistol and likes to beat his mother. Jesus. That spring, he's expelled from high school. His father has had enough and enrolls him in the military. And on June 26th, he joined the U.S. Air Force and was shipped to Texas for basic training. But he was court-martialed less than a year later for stealing the uniform of someone with a higher rank and wearing it, as well as other disorderly behavior. He did two months in the stockade before receiving a dishonorable discharge and moving back in with his parents, where he got a job pumping gas. Meanwhile, little Ralph, he went and joined the Air Force himself, where he excelled and became a paratrooper. Mike took another stab at high school in 1959, but was soon expelled. He also took a go at marriage, marrying a teenager named Linda Weir. But they were separated just three weeks later. Three weeks. That's one short marriage. 
He took up stealing cars, got busted, then put on parole, and in October of 1959, he robbed a gas station, firing a pistol through the plate glass window. Then he set his eyes on pretty 17-year-old high school student named Charlotte Weber. She says she was enthralled and described him as a beautiful and handsome young rebel, just like James Dean. Soon she was pregnant, and though her parents despised Mike, the two tied the knot and were married. Aw, that's so cute. I bet she changed that bad boy, turned him good with all her love, and they lived happily ever after, right? Not by a long shot. (laughs) He actually said that while they lived together in his parents' house, he lit fires in his room, kicked doors in, knocked holes in the wall, and often threatened his mother with violence when he wasn't roaming the streets for days on end. Yeah, sounds about right. Our budding serial killer. She also says he was very vain, staring in the mirror for hours as he combed his greasy hair just so. And not adverse to using a little eyebrow pencil. (laughs) By the time Charlotte gave birth to their daughter, Bethany, on December 12th, 1960, Mike had basically abandoned her. But he did show up once long enough to knock her up again. Charlotte's parents forced her to give this child, another daughter, up for adoption. Mike didn't care. Could it be that they were all female and he hated women with a burning passion? Or was he just such a worthless piece of shit that he didn't care about anyone but himself, including his own children? Maybe a bit of both. That would be my guess. And then Ralph came home on leave from the army, drove his car to a church parking lot, ran a hose from the exhaust in through a cracked window, went to sleep and never woke up again. Mike didn't seem too upset that his little brother Ralph, the good son, had committed suicide. Though, he did manage to somehow blame his mother for it, of course. But Mike was thinking about higher education and applied for the Texas Christian University in 1962, using a fake high school diploma he'd counterfeited himself. But when he was a second-year freshman with a D-plus average, the forgery was somehow discovered. Because of this, his probation was broken, and he was sent to the Texas State Prison in Huntsville to serve his sentence. He eventually received parole and moved in with his parents, who had now relocated to Arlington, Virginia. Soon after his move to Virginia, he was struck with severe chronic illnesses that would follow him for the rest of his life, including hepatitis, colitis, mononucleosis, and prostatitis, as well as pneumonia. Bedridden, he put a movie projector in his room and would project pornography on the walls as he convalesced to the absolute horror of his parents. Can you imagine that back then? Fucking crazy. I I actually cannot imagine it like (laughs) ever, but it's insane. It's your parents' house and you're projecting porno on your wall. Fucking, fucking hell, man. Then when Mike started hiring nude models to pose for him in the house, His mother complained, and he threatened to kill her with a hatchet. And when he eventually pulled a straight razor on his mother during an argument, his father called the county sheriff, and Mike was sent to Western State Mental Hospital in Staunton, Virginia. The psychiatrist found no sign of psychosis or mental illness and recommended jail time. But instead, Mike was released from the hospital, and four months later... He was getting married to a beautiful 19-year-old cosmetology student named Wanda Faye Davis from Taswell, Virginia. Wanda was a sweet and innocent girl who'd never even been to a fancy restaurant and whose biggest fear was staying in Taswell and becoming a, quote, hillbilly. She was swept off her feet by this sophisticated man who'd lived in so many places, including Europe. Soon after the marriage, he had her posing for nude photographs, sometimes in bondage and performing sex acts. He then told her he would send the photos to her family if she didn't help him with a banking scam he called Mr. Benson. The scam started by casing a town. Then they'd find an elderly woman, get her phone number, and call her. 
tell her they were detectives working with her bank and that managers were stealing from her account. They'd instruct her to go to the bank, make a large withdrawal, take the money back to her house, where a detective would show up to examine the money. Of course, the detective would be none other than Mike DeBartlevin, who would explain he had to take the money to examine it for evidence, but he would either return it or credit her account when he was done. Of course, of course he would. They performed this scam about 25 times in multiple states, averaging around $1,200 a scam, but getting as much as $3,500. Fucking crazy. Around this time, Mike was also arrested with Wanda's cousin in Prince George's County, Maryland, for kidnapping, sodomy, and assault on a young woman. Disgustingly, a jury found them innocent because the woman had willingly got in their car. Fuck. Wanda would later state that Mike DeBartleben's greatest goal in life was to kill a woman. He alluded to it and talked about it constantly. She claims it stemmed from his hatred for his mother. In April 1969, Mike and Wanda upped their game and committed a crazy kidnapping and ransom extortion. Mike went to the house of Edgar W. Smith Jr., an American national bank manager in Wheaton, Maryland, knowing that the man was at work. And when his wife answered, he flashed a badge and said he was with the Secret Service and needed to talk to her about banking issues related to her husband. She foolishly let him in, and he immediately pulled a gun, handcuffed, and gagged her. He then called Edgar Smith at the bank, saying to get $60,000 immediately or he would kill his wife, who he had to babble into the phone and beg for help. Smith, in a panic, grabbed as much money as he could, a little over half what was asked for, and took off, where, after a complicated game of finding hidden instructions, he ended up leaving the money in a parking lot, where Wanda came and snatched it up. The plan worked perfectly, and they were gone. Wanda said pulling off stunts like these left Mike thinking he was omnipotent and a god. Wanda also said he was never without a handgun. Among others, he had German Lugers, a 357, 38 Specials, Browning Automatics, 22 pistols. And as with all of his relationships, Mike was cruel and sadistic, putting her through both mental and physical tortures. They'd argue often. At one point during a heated argument, Wanda threatened to go to the police. So Mike tied her to the bed, where Wanda says, quote, sexual atrocities that I will not mention were performed upon me. It hurts to even think about it. You don't know the meaning of being beaten up. I'm not talking about somebody taking their fist and beating you black and blue. We are talking about things done to you that you wouldn't believe. Fuck, man. I don't like this guy, Mike, at all. I fucking hate him. <laughs> On April 27th, 1971, in Barrington, Rhode Island, real estate agent Edna McDonald received a call from a man she'd previously shown houses to named Charles Murray. Charles Murray explained he was traveling through the area, coming south from Nashaw, New Hampshire, and asked if she could show him a house as he passed through, that he'd meet her at the Sheraton Hotel in Providence the next day. He seemed like a rich businessman with a family, and she agreed. She was never seen alive again. Her body was found in the basement of the house she was showing, hanging from a rafter. She'd been strangled with her own stockings. This Charles Murray had filled out a questionnaire at one point, and handwriting experts would later say it was undoubtedly filled out by DeBart Levin. Eyewitnesses who'd seen the mysterious man in the realty office would pick Mike DeBart Levin from a lineup. We'll see him use this ruse of luring realtors several times. Back home, when Faye became pregnant, far from being elated at the idea of being a father, Mike threw her down the steps and she miscarried. But she got pregnant again and he told her to get an abortion. But she refused and left him. But Mike was done with her anyway, for he'd found the love of his life, Karen. He met the teenager on the way to the pool, and during her senior year in high school, 
He left roses in her car every single day. When her parents found out about it, they forbid the teenager from seeing this 30-year-old man. But that just made her more determined to see him. And when he told her she could show them and that all their problems would be solved if she married him, she agreed. And on July 10th, 1970, at 18 years old, she became the fourth Mrs. James Mitchell de Bartolebin Jr. By this time, Mike had marriage down to an equation and even wrote about it in his weird pages under the title, If a Man is to Come Out a Winner. So here we go. This is Mike de Bartolebin's methods to a good and healthy marriage. Oh, I can't. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Get satisfaction early. Isolate her contacts with others. Don't let her make any decisions. Don't let her acquire any skills, working, driving, social skills, etc. Don't let her have any power, bank accounts, ownership, or inside information. Collect material for blackmail. Never trust her completely. That one's so sad. Let's see. Don't enlighten her with knowledge, especially of psychology. Always remember the relationship is temporary. Double sad. Uh, Make her more dependent. No phone, no driver's license, no doctors, no books, except for fantasy. I don't know about that one. Fantasy can be very empowering for women. Yeah, that's a weird one, but... Are we shocked here that he does something weird, nonsensical? Then just drugs with a question mark. (laughs) Yeah, that one's very ominous. Well, it appears Karen was not only incredibly beautiful, but a real wild child who fell right into his swinging lifestyle. It didn't take long before Karen was pulling scams and heists with him. Mike now wearing a wide rim Stetson cowboy hat and a fake mustache. She is the absolute love of his life and will always be a part of his black and rotten heart. They lived a wild life, of drugs and crime, pulling capers and popping pills. She remembers at one point in and out of a blackout, talking Mike out of killing a young hitchhiker he'd brought back to the house to rape and torture. She said he hated women because of his mother and feared men because of his father. And... Just because she was the love of his life didn't mean she escaped his torture and abuse. He would so traumatize her, including in recordings later found by Secret Service agents, that she says her personality split into multiple people. One, a protector named Paula. Another named Melissa, who was created to take his torture. She'd also later say that he was constantly in pain from all of his physical ailments and hooked on Darwin, codeine, and methadone. In 1975, the Bartolevin savagely pistol-whipped an exotic dancer named Philippa Bolliner, but prosecutors declined the case because, quote, she was a hooker, an unsympathetic victim, too hard to convince a jury to convict, end quote. Such fucking garbage. I know. The, the, this guy goes free, you know? Yeah, fucking over bullshit. and over. DeBartolevin, who'd long been into forgery, remembered he'd made himself a high school diploma all those years ago. He buys a printing press and starts printing, obviously bogus money, and in 1976 is arrested by Secret Service agents. While DeBartolevin is in prison, Karen divorces him and goes into hiding. He serves two years, and in May 5th, 1978, the Bartolebin is released from the federal penitentiary in Danbury, Connecticut, and moves to a halfway house in Washington, D.C. He works for a while as a barber, a condition of his release, then stops coming to work, buying a dark blue 1977 Thunderbird. Meanwhile, he's mistakenly marked dead in the crime database. Oops. <laughs> 19-year-old student nurse Lucy Alexander spent Labor Day weekend 1978 in Ocean City, Maryland, where she got in a fight with her boyfriend and stormed off towards her campground. 
That's when a dark, late model luxury vehicle pulled up beside her. The, quote, wimpy looking man inside convinces her to let him drive her to the campground. He then pulled out a badge, told her he was an FBI agent, and handcuffed her wrists behind her. He then laid her in the floorboard of the back seat, covered her with blankets, and drove for hours before blindfolding her and leading her into a house where he sexually assaulted her, insisting over and over that she call him daddy. Afterwards, he complained to her how his ex-wife spent too much money. Then he put her back in his car and drove again for hours, finally releasing her in an isolated spot in Delaware called Hard Scrabble. Mike begins trolling the highways and towns of the Atlantic seaboard, visiting printing supply houses and looking for a place to set up his equipment. And using everything he's learned, continue with his goal of being a professional counterfeiter. On February 4th, 1979, 31-year-old Elizabeth Mason was working in the sales office of a track development in Fayetteville, North Carolina, when a stranger in aviator glasses appeared. The stranger explained he was house hunting, and Elizabeth took him on a short walking tour of the new subdivision. The stranger then asked Elizabeth if she could show him something more upscale, which she was happy to do. When they entered a house for sale, the stranger pulled a pistol on her. Now, Elizabeth Mason, she's tough and she's a fighter. She says she'd actually prepared for something like this and attacks him, clawing at his eyes, grabbing at the gun. The stranger viciously pistol whips her and beats her on the head with his pistol. She tumbles to the ground where he points the gun at her and squeezes the trigger. And nothing. Just a click. Again, he pulls the trigger, and again, nothing. Investigators would later find the clip of bullets there and come to the conclusion Elizabeth had inadvertently hit the clip release when she attacked him. The stranger then binds her arms and feet with adhesive tape and gags her before beating her so viciously she was knocked unconscious and had an out-of-body experience complete with angels. She received 35 stitches in her head. The stranger would later call Elizabeth Mason on the phone, amazed she had survived, almost as if he had to hear her voice to believe it. In May 1979, DeBart Eleven found a wood-framed bungalow down a dead-end street in Falls Church, Virginia, and set up his counterfeiting operation. On April 9th, 1979, in Baldwin, Missouri, 24-year-old Sheila Grant is pulled over leaving a bar by what she thought was an unmarked police car. The supposed officer put her in his car at gunpoint and fondled her before releasing her. Investigators would later determine DeBart Levitt had checked into the Scottish Inn located a mere miles from where Sheila was pulled over. On Memorial Day weekend 1979 in Ocean City, Maryland, just before midnight, 20-year-old Lori Jensen is abducted after closing the convenience store she managed. The man who takes her claims to be a police officer and waves a badge in her face before handcuffing and gagging her, blindfolding her, putting her in the backseat of his car and driving for hours. Exactly like Lucy Alexander, she is brought to a house and sexually assaulted. These assaults would last for three days. The kidnapper entering the room naked except for a burlap sack over his head with the eyes and mouth cut out. Fuck, how terrifying is that? He savagely tortured her, tying her up into painful bondage poses, putting a cigar out on her back, demanding she call him daddy and tell him how much she liked it, photographing and tape recording the entire excruciating ordeal. Agents would find these photographs, as well as tapes of the assaults labeled Becky, a name he used for many of his victims. It appears in his sick fantasy world, he is daddy and all of the victims, Becky. Between assaults, he'd put her in a closet where she was chained to an eyeball on the floor. He then drove her to Maryland and dropped her off blocks away from her house, telling her if she went to the police, 
he released photographs of her naked. Just that he knows exactly where she lived is so creepy and terrifying. Totally. He then meets New Jersey girl Barbara Abbott in a disco. She wanted to be an elementary school teacher, but instead became the fifth wife of Mike DeBartolaven. Oh, God. He wooed her by showing her fake IDs in multiple states he had made, saying he could, quote, get away with all kinds of stuff with them. He also shows her some of the funny money he's now producing on his new printing press. He does his routine on her, has her involved in all kinds of extortion and attempts to rob banks as well. And they nearly get caught in Baltimore, the police arresting them, but releasing them for lack of evidence and not prosecuting. They marry reportedly so that if they were ever caught and put on trial, she couldn't testify against them and spent their honeymoon in the Florida Keys, passing off fake 20s. Then the Bart 11 begins taking off for weeks at a time, sometimes mailing her money, sometimes not. He's the mall passer now and appearing all over the country under an insane amount of aliases. On March 30th, 1980, he's in his hometown of Little Rock, registered at the Best Western Motel as Alan Kirk. On April 21st, he's in Falls Church as James R. Jones. Then at the Columbus, Ohio Holiday Inn, checked in as Michael B. Shelton. And later at a La Quinta in Indianapolis as Thomas R. Curry. In Massachusetts, he's Morris Pocott. In Nashville, he's Roger Colin Blanchard later buying a handgun as Robert Tremblay. In Wisconsin, he's Paul Donnelly, passing off a flurry of fake 20s. And in Kansas City, he's Roy Sledge. I like that one. (laughs) Roy Sledge, be a good name for a noir detective. Roy Sledge, P.I. Totally. But uh, as he roams the country, passing off 20s, he's also continuing to abduct and sexually assault women. On December 11th, 1980, Maria Santini was working behind the counter of a clothing store in Willingboro, New Jersey, listening to the Frank Sinatra Hour, when a slender white male in a black trench coat and dark business suit entered, pulled a gun, and declared he was robbing the place. He bound Maria, emptied the cash register, then led Maria by gunpoint to his car, laid her down, and covered her with a blanket. He took her to a house where he removed her shoes and underpants before leaving the room. When he returned, he was in a yellow miniskirt and high heels. He began to rub her feet and said to her, I guess you think I'm pretty strange. Yeah, understatement. But uh, she replied back, oh, no, not, not strange at all. Obviously terrified and trying to placate him. To which he told her he saw this situation in a magazine, and it looked fun, so he decided to try it. He then set up a tripod and camera and began tying Maria up into different bondage positions with rope, including the Chinese hog tie, which is particularly painful, photographing everything. But after a while, he seemed to get bored, had her dress, drove her to the New Jersey Pine Barrens and let her go, asking her if she needed any money to make a phone call or anything. But Mike's new wife, Barbara, was suffering severe mental health issues. She was deeply depressed. She felt abandoned, ashamed, and alone. And in early 1981, when Mike was laid up with another bout of pneumonia, she snuck away and left him, going into hiding, as Karen had done. On May 6th, 1983, Michelle Wallace is pulled over in Bloomfield, Connecticut. When the supposed officer tries to force his way into the car with her, she puts up a terrific fight and begins blowing the horn, and the man runs away when the headlights of an oncoming car illuminate him. Fake 20s had been passed at a mall not far away, and Michelle would later identify DeBart 11 from a photo lineup. Later, photographs of women found in DeBart 11's storage unit would be linked to missing sex workers in the same area. On April 27, 1980, 82. On April 27, 1982, real estate agent Jean McFowl in Bossier City, Louisiana, goes to show a Dr. Zach an expensive home in a new suburban subdivision called Green Acres and never returns. Police later discover her body 
in the attic. She'd been strangled to death and suspended from a rafter by her neck, nearly exactly like real estate agent Edna McDonald in Rhode Island. The crimes were so similar, they were what investigators call layovers, meaning you could lay the cases over each other and they'd match perfectly. But unlike the Rhode Island murder, the killer had also stabbed Jean multiple times after she was dead. But like the Rhode Island murder, she was not sexually assaulted in any way. Two days before the murder, the mall pastor had been passing bills in Tyler, Texas, on Interstate 20, which heads east right through Bossier City. Agents would later find references to a Dr. Zach alias in DeBart Levin's house, and license plates in DeBart Levin's storage unit would be found to have been stolen from cars in the same area at the same time. Later, witnesses who saw the two together would also pick DeBart Levin out of a photo lineup. So it seems like there's a pattern here. He's targeting older real estate agents and murdering them, but he's not sexually assaulting them. These are women who look very much like his mother. Psychologists would even speculate that the idea of looking at a home with an older woman was symbolic. The home itself being a symbol of the mother and the house even being seen as a womb. And conversely, he's abducting young girls and raping them, but letting them go, not killing them. Women who look like his ex-wife, Karen. Just how many women DeBart Levin may have raped and killed over his long career as a sociopath, we'll never know. Forty women in his collection of photographs are still yet to be identified, many covered in bruises and ligature marks. And these are just some of the many crimes he's thought to be a part of. He's also been tied to the brutal murder of an exotic dancer in 1983 in Beaumont, Texas, as well as the murder of a man named Joe Rapini in a banking heist scheme gone wrong in New York. Mike DeBart Levin was facing many, many, many trials across the country for counterfeiting, extortion, kidnapping, assault, rape, sodomy, as well as three pending murder trials. The first of these many trials was the federal counterfeiting charge, which was a complicated bit of legal wrangling designed to ensure maximum penalty, where the prosecutors sought to mix in the violent sex crimes so that Mike could be labeled a special offender meaning he was guilty of a multitude of very different crimes and an incredibly dangerous man deserving of a long sentence. Mike serves as his own lawyer and actually does quite well, claiming since there was no warrant, all the evidence from the storage locker should be inadmissible. And the judge considers it. That would be it. Game over. The prosecution is freaking out. The judge even compliments the Bart 11 on his legal expertise. Like, what but, the fuck? Sorry, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> but ultimately, strikes down the motion to suppress the evidence for, in the original arrest warrant the Secret Service obtained for the mall passer, there was a clause in there authorizing the search of any and all residents known to the suspect. In his effort to obtain a special offender status against DeBar Levin during the counterfeiting trial, the prosecutor would go into dark and graphic detail over the types of violent sex acts and pornography involved in the case and actually personally apologized to the judge for putting the court through the trauma. The judge said he perfectly understood what the prosecutor was trying to do, prove what a dangerous man this was, and agreed, sentencing him to five counts of 25 years each as a special offender to be served consecutively not concurrently, for a total of 125 years. Then, in the next trial in Baltimore, he was given 180 years, also to run consecutively, making the total 305 years with parole only possible after serving 59 of them. This heavy amount of time ensured DeBart Levin would never be a free man again, and prosecutors in other states like Connecticut decided it wasn't worth the time and money to advance their cases. But in 1986, New Jersey decided to go ahead and hold a trial. Maria Santini, whom he'd abducted and assaulted in 1980, was a witness. And Mike, 
representing himself as a lawyer, repeatedly tried to trip her up on the stand. Especially when flustered, she would refer to her attacker as he instead of you. But she redeemed herself when Mike asked her, Do you want to see the man who did this crime to you punished? She replied, I would like to see you in prison, yes. He was found guilty, another 60 years tacked on, with no parole eligibility for 30 years. The judge saying, in effect, the man is now serving an absolute minimum of 345 and a half years. His next and final trial was in Manasaw, Virginia in 1986. The FBI had been able to identify some of the photographs and a tape recording labeled Becky as being Lori Jensen, who DeBart Levin had kidnapped in Ocean City, Maryland in 1979. But having her confirm it was her and testify in court would be tantamount to re-victimizing her, forcing her to relive her trauma. It was a delicate situation. But Lori was a trooper and bravely took the stand, which was when DeBart Levin showed the world what a soulless, remorseless piece of trash he was. While the rest of the courtroom sat in stunned and unnerved silence as the tape of Lori's torture was played, DeBart Levin was said to have grinned and openly enjoyed Lori Jensen's pain as she testified. But when he cross-examined her, he got so caught up in it all that he revealed details only the kidnapper could know, basically proving that he was, in fact, the culprit, completely ruining his defense. He was given another life sentence, at which point he called the courtroom a bunch of communists. <laughs> okay. Louisiana announced a murder trial for the death of real estate agent Gene McFall, then quietly rescinded it, later explaining that the case was only worth it if they could give him the death penalty and execute him. But that was going to be complicated. For in order to do that, they needed to show premeditated intent to kill, as well as proof that the murder was performed in the course of another felony. It was all just too complicated. Not to mention there was no direct evidence, such as fingerprints, and the district attorney deemed it not worth all the time and money. Rhode Island followed suit and declined to move forward with their murder trial as well. In each instance, the victims' families were outraged that there would be no justice for their loved ones. But Mike DeBartolevin was going to prison and never, ever getting out. That much was certain. In a bizarre twist, his second daughter with Charlotte, who had been put up for adoption... Well, after becoming a successful pediatrician and starting a family of her own, decided to track down who her biological parents were. Suffice it to say, she was shocked to realize her father was the infamous mall passer. She did eventually decide to send him a letter. He immediately wrote back, and the two became pen pals. Mm, well, they say blood is thicker than water. She even visited him once, just once. She said his eyes were unimaginably cold and empty, predatory, and that it felt like she was looking at the devil. The visit made her sick to her stomach, and she never returned. And Mike Bartolevin would die of pneumonia in 2011 at the age of 70. And there you have it, the life, crimes, and death of Mike de Bartolevin, the infamous mall passer. Whew. Wild case. And, you know, this is another one you would never seem to hear about. I did not know about this. This I this came across man, it randomly. These crimes. I feel like like this. I don't want to, like, minimize all of these, like, real painful, awful things that happen to all of these people. But, like, I feel like this would make a very good movie. Like, just because it's a crazy story with it starts out like they think they're just going after this money counterfeiter and the person that he really was is just so much darker and more horrific than I think anybody would have ever imagined. Like it just it's, seems like the plot of like a, a thriller where you think you're getting one thing and it just follows these bizarre twists and turns until you're like, just what is happening? Totally. It's got all the elements of a great thriller, fucking crime horror, like silence of the lambs kind of movie. It's, 
the women yeah. that he brought in and like made sort of his accomplices. I think it's a little bit more like they're his accomplices via Stockholm syndrome because they're also being like horrifically abused and tortured themselves. And blackmail. Seems like, yeah. And the first chance that they have to get out and go into hiding, they take. Where are Karen and is it Michelle blanking on the second wife to go into hiding? Where are they now? I have no idea. They, they were seriously trauma. Like everyone that he is ever involved with is like, he like destroyed them mentally. Like they were just like, could barely even talk. Like Karen was like, she could barely talk to the investigators without like bursting into tears and freaking out. And like, she said that she had, um, you know, had these different personalities now. And they said that she, they would watch her shift into it. Like when she would get defensive, she would become another person to like deal Jesus. with the trauma. It's uh, but uh, luckily, uh, they're uh, all of that. Like you said, they are accomplices. But um, by the time they busted him for all that, the um, statute of limitations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good. Not to re-traumatize them any further than they needed to be. Like, I don't know, man. It's that thin line of like, what are you actually <clears throat> responsible for if you're being manipulated by somebody like this? I mean, this is like a whole other level of just fuckery <laughs> <laughs> totally it's it's a it's fascinating and scary as hell yeah i'm telling you <clears throat> I, it's like the creepiest thought ever but when he was looking at houses and he's you know he's a, a man that wants to buy a house with the exact basement that he wants that he's envisioned <laughs> that's like the biggest red flag ever. I, I didn't I, realize how dangerous it is to be a real estate agent. Uh, apparently, it's they say that that kind of shit happens all the time, and <laughs> you have these uh, you know people that they'll show the house at any time because people are like, "Oh, I work all day. Can you show it to me at night?" And, right. And you, right. you go to this house with a stranger, this empty house. Right. And what what is the proof? You know, like if you're in business for yourself or you work for a company where, you know, like you're doing showings after hours, you're not in your office, you're not like logging your visits anywhere. You could just leave your house with the only proof of you going anywhere is like a text message between you and a stranger. I mean, in today's day and age, probably not in the 1980s, the text message. But yeah. And then you're just you're gone. Whew, man crazy horrifying and i just to look at this guy i mean i know right it's never what somebody looks like of course but you just look at this he's like a little plain looking I, yeah and he's you know he's slender he's not a, a big guy he's not it, he's just kind of like a little little nerd man that yeah uh, the one he picked up that woman um uh in Ocean City, Maryland, she says she got in the car with him because he looked like a wimp. Yeah. He looked safe. And he, he used a gun, you know? He, so. Right. Oh, good grief. <laughs> yeah, uh... good grief. And with that, I want to say uh, thank you so much, dear listeners and fellow freaks, for listening. And hey, we want to hear from you. Got a case you think we should cover? Did we get something wrong? You just want to say hi? Drop us a line at MurderCoasterPodcast at gmail.com. That's MurderCoasterPodcast at gmail.com. And we will catch you next time.